welcome to Agenda 85. I am your host for today's program, Paul Cunningham. Today we're going to be taking a look at tax reform. Our guests for today, our panelists, include John Ashby, Professor of History at Catonsville Community College. Uh, Roland Sturm, uh, he is also a professor in the Business Division at Catonsville. He is a CPA. He also has his Juris Doctorate degree. And our last panelist is Don Jansowitz. Don is Professor of Political Science also at the college. Now, gentlemen, uh, let me pose a question uh, if you will, first of all, uh, are my perceptions right that uh, it seems like uh, year in and year out as I pick up my paycheck, more and more winds up going into taxes? I wonder if we could, if we could pursue that. Is that a myth that, uh, that uh, our taxes are actually increasing, that the bite of taxes that comes out of our amount of money uh, is increasing? Or is it something that uh, recent tax reform uh, is going to alleviate? It's certainly a major national topic. Yes, you're, you're getting uh, tax increases of one type or another. We're probably going to be focusing today mostly on the income tax, but there's uh, Social Security taxes that exist. There's all kinds of uh, other taxes that are built into the system, not just uh, national taxes, but state taxes and local taxes as well. Yes, the tax bite is increasing and may be just shifting from one place to another, but it's just a, a net increase. One of those major increases is income tax. Let's dwell with that for a minute. Uh, we have a federal and state tax. Of course, the biggest concern is federal tax. Uh, President Reagan has suggested that we make some major uh, changes, and there have been arguments and discussions about uh, how those changes will affect us. Uh, Roland, could you enlighten us as to where we are with the progress of this tax reform? Well, thus far, there are three major uh, tax bills uh, floating around Congress, and I think the earliest one, as the Democrats have recently uh, made clear to everyone, was originated by uh, Senator Bradley and Representative Gephardt, uh, and I think that goes back to 1983. Uh, following that, um, Representative Kemp and Senator Kasten uh, have proposed a uh, each of these things are referred to as a flat tax, but in fact, they're n none of them truly are a flat tax. And then uh, we have the recent pronouncement by the uh, Treasury, uh, which is their version of, of, a, of a flat tax, which in, in reality is a, a modified progressive tax system, not quite as progressive as we presently have, but uh, not, surely not a flat tax. Go ahead, Paul. No, I was going to say, uh, maybe you can answer it, or John, uh, do, are we looking at uh, political maneuvering here in Congress? Uh, I don't think any one package is going to be approved, or am I wrong? Is it going to be a result of compromise? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I can't say for sure what's going to happen. My, my best guess uh, uh, is that uh, but the Democrats, are, in, in, at least in the House of Representatives, are going to hold the tax reform proposals hostage to the uh, so, to some approach to dealing with the uh, with, with the deficit problem. And uh, tax reform will be kept on the back burner, in my opinion, at least in the House of Representatives, until there is some linkage worked out between how we're going to deal with the problem of the deficit and how we're going to uh, deal with the problem of taxes. Because uh, there's obviously a relationship uh, between the two. The Democrats are committed to the idea that the, uh, a large part, if not the largest part, of the, the recent uh, incredible expansion of the deficit is the result of Mr. Reagan's tax policies, those policies that were introduced back in 1981. Their argument is if we hadn't cut taxes four years ago, um, that the deficit would not be anywhere near the uh, monstrosity that it is today. So there, there's going to be some kind of linkage, I think, worked out between deficit reduction on the one hand and tax reform on the other. And frankly, I think the Democrats, particularly in the House of Representatives, will use that uh, linkage as to, to keep tax reform in hostage until it's done. Who benefits wrong? Allegedly, uh, all the bills are supposed to be revenue neutral. Uh, 
um, except the uh, Kemp casting, and there's a slight decrease in the uh, revenues that come in from that. Uh, nearly all of them have to uh, have to admit to easing the burden at both ends of the spectrum. In other words, uh, people with low income, uh, there'll be uh, you'll have to have more income before you finally become subject to tax. And people at the high end of the spectrum naturally are going to benefit because in every case there's a substantial reduction from the present 50 percent maximum rate to a maximum rate of uh, 35 percent in the Treasury bill, uh, 30 percent in the uh, uh, Bradley Kepler bill, and uh, 25 percent in the Kemp Caston bill. So you can see that if a person has $500,000 worth of income, he's going to save one whopping amount of taxes. It does seem that the, uh, the middle classes will have to take up the slack to some degree in each of these bills. Aren't the, isn't the middle class, though, paying the bills now? Isn't that, isn't that where the, the bulk of the revenue is coming from presently, the middle class? Absolutely. I mean, that's, right. always, the, uh, that's always the problem, is that the, the, uh, the both ends of the spectrum seem to benefit. And that's, a little, that's one aspect of these bills yeah. that's somewhat puzzling to me, uh, other than the fact that I think that um, uh, their theory is that if, with a lower marginal tax rate, it will take the people who have the money to invest out of less productive investments like tax shelters mm -hmm. and, and they will invest their money in things that will really keep the economy going and moving. That's the assumption that that's made. I'm not sure I agree with that. Yeah. So there has been, there has been a, uh, in the public debate that's been, occur, been occurring, there's, I've heard it charged over and over again that the middle class is going to going to get bitten uh, on this one. They're getting bitten presently by, by the tax system. So that's a, a kind of a, a, a straw man argument in the way of tax reform, that it's going to somehow shift the burden of the middle class. It's already there. Is the burden really there, or is that a myth? It's, it's there. Well, yeah, oh, it's clearly there. it's there. I mean, it, it, the, the majority, that's why when you, when you, when they talk about any type of tax reform, they immediately go to things where there's the, uh, the greatest uh, the greatest number of people are claiming that type of deduction. Uh, so if they're gonna if they're going to uh, bring in revenue, they want it may seem like a picky in thing to us, like the, the one of the most uh, uh, recent things that they're talking about very seriously is things like some of the bills drop sales tax deduction. And to you and I, we might say. Uh, well, the sales tax deduction is not such a big thing anyhow, so who cares? But because it hits the broad base, the, 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 it still brings in a lot of revenue. So it's the type of, of changes they like to make. What, what, are, the, uh, what are the sacred cows uh, that uh, no one is willing to uh, uh, deal with? For example, things like uh, charitable uh, contributions. Is that a sacred cow? Relatively speaking, it is. They, all three bills permit uh, deductions to charities, but Treasury is going to uh, only allow you to deduct your charitable contributions to the extent that they exceed 2% of your adjusted gross income. But even that, we've already heard that there's been some significant uh, repri uh, reprisals from, from groups on that. So you might see them back off of that. One of, the, one of the things that's clearly a sacred cow, uh, and it's interesting because uh, two of the bills attack fringe benefits, make fringe benefits taxable, uh, such as the medical insurance and things like that. But the one sacred cow of all three bills is clearly your um, retirement plans, your IRAs, uh, individual retirement accounts, and your Kios. None of them are, are going to touch them, and in fact, Treasury is going to bring the, uh, wants to raise the limit to 2,500 and then permit the non-working spouse to have her own 2,500 IRA as well. So uh, that's, that's one of the real sacred cows because I think they, they, uh, they want people to be able to fund their retirement without looking exclusively to Social Security. Isn't, isn't another uh, sacred cow the uh, interest on your mortgage payments? Yes, that does seem to be, uh, all three agree that that's going to continue to be deductible. The interest on your home mortgage will continue to be deductible without any limitation. It sounds to me like you're saying, though, that there are some efforts to try to protect the so-called middle class. Um, 
even if it looks as though the upper class and those who have a great deal of money are going to benefit the most, you have to give uh, a small sop of some kind to the middle class to, uh, uh, to protect them or at least make them feel as though they've gotten a little something out of this uh, change. I, I think they've all tried to be fair about it in, in their approach to it and try to minimize its impact on the middle class. And, and although I made the statement that it appears that the impact is going to be on the middle class, I don't think anybody really knows. I mean, one of the things that I've found in my experience with tax uh, reform is that as the bills are written, no one really understands what its full impact is going to be on the public until it's actually in place and trying to operate. And we've, we've had occasions where significant reform has occurred and been passed and signed by the president. And this was called carryover basis. It was one of Carter's favorites. And before it was ever actually used, it was actually a law for two years. It was never applied, and it was repealed before it was ever applied. Because they, in many instances, have not thought through all the administrative and the other repercussions that, that go along with it. Yeah, we're talking about repercussions. I, I guess my view is the greatest repercussion would be on the uh, accounting or tax avoidance industry. That's, that's of any of this legislation, that's who would be really hurt by it. Because that, that group of people who have, who are, have developed the expertise in taxation, and ta tax law and the administration of ta tax law, that's uh, it's like the dagger at the throat of that entire industry. Well, there used to be a time um, when a great many people um, would try to make out their own income tax. Is it getting so confusing that you find that more and more of your colleagues are getting a greater volume of people saying, forget it, I'm going to pay the extra money and have someone who's a professional, a CPA, do the tax for me because I can't understand the laws anymore? And doesn't it, another question occurs to me, doesn't it make it awfully difficult for you as a CPA to keep track of what the federal uh, changes are in the tax structure? Yeah, I, I think the, the what, what happens is because of the the constant changing of the tax code, and one uh, one study I read it said that since 1976 they've uh, they've had uh, a change in the tax code uh, on an average of every 15 months, and we've had uh, three major tax bills since 1981. Uh, that is the type of thing that will drive the average person to distraction and finally saying, hey, I can't, I can't handle it anymore. I'm going to give it to somebody and let them worry about it. And so every year, each time they do change the code, it seems like you will pick up one or two clients. If, if they would just resist the temptation to modify things every uh, so frequently, I think more people would eventually uh, become used to the law and then be able to deal with their returns themselves. But it's the constant changing that causes the problem. But, but people who still uh, gain most of their income or all of their income through wages probably can still do their tax preparation themselves, don't you think? Yes, in fact, there's a, there's a form called the 1040EZ, which all you have to do is put your wages on it and send a form in and the government will calculate the tax for you. So they do try to do things that will help people prepare their returns. And while we're on the subject, I might as well get a plug in for the VITA program, which we have here at Cageville, which is a volunteer income tax assistance program. And right at this very moment, we have about six or seven volunteers doing uh, tax returns for retired persons in the uh, ADFAC building here at Cadesville Community College. And any of you out there who have any interest in that, please feel free to take us up on our offer to do your return free uh, on Thursday afternoons in February and March uh, from 12 to uh, 4 p.m. Let me ask you something to, to follow up with that. The thought crosses my mind. Uh, <clears throat> I have run across several retired people who have different sources of income, and, and, and they say to me that uh, that uh, as long as they have their house paid for, which they do, and have other sources of income, that um, they don't mind uh, uh, the taxes increasing some if it's, if it's spent properly. Um, that's a big, that seems to be a big issue now, not only just the tax cut and what kind of changes might be made, 
but the way in which tax money is spent. Let me ask a general question. Where does the tax money go? Where does that federal money go that's taken out of my paycheck every Increasingly into defense, uh, reversing a pattern in, in which it was, it was used to be increasing in the domestic area. So it was a, well, really two areas of in increase, defense on the, uh, the operating side of government and, mm -hmm. and social security, which you have to put Talk, uh, talk about that when you start talking about taxes. Those two areas of, of taxation, or those two areas of, of spending are going up and up and up and driving taxes right along, along with it. And, and, and let's not forget the interest on the national debt, yeah. uh, which is going yeah. up yeah. as we sit here, uh, <laughs> it's increasing. You know, somebody once made the clever remark that, uh, that taxation is the price that we pay for civilization. And I think the current concern is that we're not getting our money's worth. In other words, the, the civilization, quote unquote, that we're, we're getting for our money is not measuring up to the standards that we would like to see it uh, measure up to. A lot of people believe that our, uh, the, the crime in our streets and the uh, mediocrity of our school systems and uh, uh, the fact that the roads are full of potholes, uh, all these things they seem to indicate that um, uh, maybe we're not getting our money's worth when we, when we pay our taxes. And if the government is buying $6,000 toilet seats uh, for its airplanes, clearly there's something, uh, some kind of uh, uh, problem uh, going on here. Is that a part of the tax uh, reform uh, process, uh, not only to make it easier uh, to perhaps hold the line on tax increases, but is there anything in any of these programs that says that along the way we will set goals and objectives and standards on how we are going to purchase material and how our money, our tax money is spent? No, not, not in these, uh, these revenue bills, but I think as John indicates, probably Congress will probably try to tie the two together in some way so that, uh, that there are significant uh, reductions in government spending to go with these tax bills uh, as, they're, as they follow the, the legislative process, if they do, in fact, ever get enacted. Mm -hmm. You doubt they are going to get enacted? Well, they're extremely radical uh, changes, and there are a lot of uh, repercussions that, that need to be thought of, out and, and given a lot of consideration to. Two of the major ones that come to my mind is the taxation of these fringe benefits like medical insurance. Presently, uh, the idea that the employer pays for a large percentage of your medical insurance uh, and he gets a deduction for it without it being taxable income to you uh, encourages you to use a conventional type insurer. Uh, once you say that you're going to have to pay tax, and I think uh, in our case at Catonsville Community College, it's about $2,500. You're going to have additional taxable income of approximately $2,500. You may start saying, maybe uh, I want to do something else besides this plan that uh, the college is offering me. And since I'm really paying it because I'm paying the tax on it, give me my $2,500 and I'll deal with it as I will, either through some type of self-insurance or perhaps I'll shop around for another program that gives me a little different type of benefit. You're going to have some risk takers coming out of that system, which, which the original intention of that provision in Internal Revenue Code was to encourage people to be covered and to, to encourage employers to make that type of benefit available. Second one I see a problem with is uh, two of these bills don't permit, for, permit little or no deduction for state, uh, state income tax. Kempcaston doesn't allow it, and neither does the Treasury proposal. So that means that the cost of your paying your state income tax, the effective after tax dollar cost is going to go up because it's no longer deductible for federal purposes. And that means uh, you're going to be a little more reluctant. You're going to think a little more about that 7% that you're paying to the state, 7.5, which is really not 7.5%. It's probably about 4.5 because you get a deduction for it. Uh, you're going to think a lot longer and harder, and I think you're going to find more evasionary uh, tactics being, uh, being uh, played uh, at the state level for all taxes because all three of them, I think, did away with sales tax. And, uh, and one of them did away with real estate tax as a deduction. So it's going to make it more difficult for the states to raise their revenue. They're going to have the compliance problem 
jobs rather than the federal government. Well, haven't we been playing games with ourselves through the, uh, the income taxes that's structured? We don't know. Most people really don't know the impact of the, 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 the state income tax because it is because it is uh, covered. Uh, uh, it's forgiven by it's forgiven by the federal taxes, and they don't know the real cost of of, of health insurance. And if we went to tax simplification, wouldn't the result of it be that people would be able to start calculating what's how much things cost and what they what they really want to do? Absolutely, that's the other side of it. You know, if the social policy is to make sure that everybody has some type of coverage in the event of some medical catastrophe, that's fine. But the other school of thought, and I think the irony of it is, I think you got people who would normally argue in favor of uh, free enterprise and uh, get Big Brother off our back, perhaps being concerned about taking away this kind of a social social type provision uh, and maybe if you've decided that one of the ways to attack the ever rising medical cost is by this process of taxing the fringes and having people uh, fewer people insured by major insurance companies and self-insured and make the uh, the ability to charge big fees when if you're paying the bill and not the insurance company you're going to take a second look at that doctor bill and you're going to argue with him and, uh, and and try to get it down to what it will be. So that's a possible favorable aspect of it, as long as as you can live with the other end of it. That some people are going to have some catastrophes who, who are risk takers that won't be covered by insurance. Roland, let me ask you a question: Is is anybody in Congress, to your knowledge, or maybe Don uh, knows as well? Is anyone in Congress, to your knowledge, uh, seriously talking about doing away with the income tax altogether and replacing it with hmm. some other form of taxation, such as the uh, so-called value-added tax or some other kind of flat uh, tax system? There is that a serious alternative? Yeah, yeah, there has been a bill that that's I forget who proposed it, but there was a bill that was that was uh, circulating on a. Uh, I believe it was a national sales tax, and uh, it hasn't gotten very far. And the report I, I read uh, from the uh, staff study on the subcommittee on economic goals and intergovernmental policy was totally against a consumption tax. It was absolutely uh, very negative toward that approach, um, even though it admitted that that approach does favor savings. Some of those, there are some really radical approaches to that 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 are scary. Uh, the uh, one proposal uh, would tax you on your borrowing. In other words, it would tax you on every inflow of cash into your into your personal control. And uh, things like that are, are somewhat frightening aspects of it. But I'm sure those things could be worked out. And that may ultimately be the answer, or some combination of that with the income tax to, to uh, straighten out our taxing system. Because that, that could produce revenue. Those kinds of taxes can produce revenue, and it's not it, it, they can manipulate the rate, but that's about all they can manipulate yeah. with those kind of taxes. Where the income tax, is, it's, it's how imaginative one is uh, in terms of developing new ways to write off, uh, write off costs. Some information I have says that a 1% a sales tax before administrative costs would raise about 17.5 million in revenue. I hope I have that right if we need to you. Yeah, that sounds like a, Good going. a large amount. Yeah. Uh, tax reform, whether or not it passes, bring it down to the county level if we can for just a, a moment. What happens to my property tax and the other county taxes? Are, do you see those continuing to rise and maybe rising at a faster rate if we, if we put a ceiling somehow or a reform on federal taxes? Well, the only way that that would happen is already, I guess, taking place because the revenue sharing uh, situation is, is apparently coming to an end. And you, you may have more pressures to raise the state and local taxes because yeah. of that. But you're going to have more resistance from the taxpayers because it's now costing them more to pay their state and local taxes. I think you could reasonably expect that over the course of the next 10 years that local government in particular is going to cost a whole lot more money because they're doing so much. They're involved in so many uh, ex expensive kinds of projects. So that property tax, if we can continue with the property tax, is going to either move up through assessments or move, uh, move up through rate. 
what is the what is the public willing to take in the way of taxes? Uh, if you were a strategist looking at the entire tax structure, let's say, um, would you rather take the small bits and pieces and continue to increase the federal rate, um, or do you think uh, people would would rather see the taxes taken at the local rate, county taxes, for instance, assuming that it would be spent locally? And they would have more control over it. Well, if you believe that the uh, the counties and the local subdivisions can more efficiently handle the funds and, and give the services that John was talking about, uh, then then you'd rather see the federal government rate declining with the local rates going up. Uh, hopefully, that's going to be a, a happy mix where you don't get any appreciable overall increase. But that's the question mark about all these radical radically new proposals that so dramatically change the existing system. It's awfully difficult to foresee what would happen and what's going to happen. Yeah, that's why, you know, excuse me, go ahead. That's all. Okay. Yeah, that's why I think it's imperative that, that at this time public officials at the local level make a, a judgment call in terms of what is going to happen on this tax legislation in Congress because they're going to have to position the tax rate before it happens because it's going to be much higher to to uh, start raising rates afterwards. Uh, it's, it's going to be harder. Much, much harder. Right. Much harder. So it's the best best do it now. While it's still deductible. Yeah. It isn't uh, isn't another question mark in this whole system the, the performance of the economy as a whole? You know, if the economy continues to expand and and we continue to have uh, several years of prosperity, that that makes possible one kind of tax uh, reform. On the other hand, if the economy begins to falter again and we begin to see uh, uh, serious problems of uh, unemployment or inflation comes back, uh, that would seem to me to, to lead to a, perhaps a different approach to taxation. So isn't there a, another question mark, uh, the way that the economy as a whole performs? Of course, I think that's what Kemp Caston has always had as his Jack Kemp always believes that by lowering that marginal tax rate, you will encourage the investment into better areas, areas that will keep the economy going and then we'll have a strong economy. And therefore, even though we have a lower tax rate, we'll actually get more taxes because our GNP will have increased. And, and that's the happy theory that they, they, they labor under and some people have called it, uh, you know, total economic folly, but but it's yeah. it's it's set to that, uh, yeah. to that unit. Well, we have pretty much run out of time. I could ask you one short question: Are taxes going down anywhere? And that wouldn't take too many seconds <laughs> to answer. Uh, we thank you, uh, gentlemen. I thank you, uh, Roland, John, and Don, for being with us on this panel. Uh, it certainly is a, an interesting issue because it has ramifications in terms of how we spend our money and and uh, and what it is going to be used for in the future. Uh, we thank you uh, for being with this panel, and we hope to see you again on Agenda 85.